How would you feel if you hired someone to assist you during an especially difficult time in your life only to find out that there had been extensive emotional manipulation, trying to get close to you, and eventually engaging in financial fraud that included stealing from your kid's college fund, creating separate bank accounts under your name that you didn't know about, opening up credit cards under your name, and racking up a debt of close to $2 million. This may sound like a movie, but it is not. Today, I welcome the brave Jumana Kid onto my channel whose mission is to share her story in the hopes that others don't have to go through what she already has. Stay tuned to hear the level of manipulation that occurred and how this process really unfolded. Welcome to Dine In Psychology. Stay tuned because I'm about to get right into the interview today. Nice to meet you, and I'm so glad that we got connected through our mutual friend. I don't know if she wants to remain anonymous, but here we are. If you don't mind just sharing a little bit about yourself, who are you? What do you do? All of that good stuff. So, my name is Jamana Kid, and I'm a mom of three amazing adult children, and was always working in the media space. I worked uh, with extra NBA TV, just, you know, um, lots of TV hosting and, uh, correspondence. Um, now I'm in this more of the fundraising space. I'm also an app developer. I've developed an app called dear God app, mm. which is, yeah, which is a, a prayer app for just anyone. Like it's not about religion. It's more about being there to support someone help them learn how to pray pray with them you get like you know live interaction so it's not about just going to grab a scripture and the funny thing is it's still in beta we're figuring out like little quirks and stuff but I, it's nuts how much traffic I already get um, I can only imagine yeah. yeah well thank you Jumana for just kind of sharing a little bit about yourself I know that we were introduced and with my content that I create and just being a mental health provider I am so passionate about prevention and awareness whether it is domestic violence cultic high control groups or scams and con artists. And I might as well just go ahead and tell everyone we are both battling our, our dogs today. And so if you hear little barks here and there, just bear with us. We are going to make this. Mine are in rare happen. form for some reason today. It's like they want <laughs> airtime or something. So Jumana, tell me a little bit about your experience with con artist. However, I know it's quite the story. So wherever you want to jump in and just share. In a nutshell, I was moving to Los Angeles from um, the East Coast and I had just found out I was, I was diagnosed with stage one cancer oh, and wow. I was fortunate enough where I didn't have to do chemotherapy, but I did have to do radiation. Yeah. So I was going to start the radiation as soon as I moved into my home and I you know, knew that I was going to need some type of assistant, even though I wasn't working actively at that moment. I just, you know, with my children, with getting settled in a brand new area and, um, you know, not even kind of knowing where, you know, my whole work situation was headed in a new state. I um, just kind of wanted someone who was just going to not like a full-time assistant, not even a clerical type executive assistant type, just someone who was open to helping transporting kids. My ex-husband prefers to deal through like assistance when it comes, but like, like I don't speak to him directly when it comes to like the kids' medical okay. bills and mm -hmm. someone that can deal with that. Sure. You know, with his, you know, that kind of stuff that I got a great referral, I thought <laughs> from someone I trusted a lot. And this person, you know, had no idea. They, they even said full disclosure. I don't know her personally. I just know that when I worked with this company, we would always call her for like concierge stuff. And she was a boss. She was always on it. She got things done. Um, and I almost thought like, well, this sounds, this sounds a little bit too, like this person sounds too qualified for what I'm looking for. But I was like, you know, let me just meet her. We set up a meeting and she was so kind, so sweet, so accommodating, so empathetic. It just knew how to connect. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, I have a concierge service that I run. Obviously this won't be like, you know, the kind of job where I, you know, come to your, you know, your house or an office. I would just kind of be remote and whatever you needed. And I'm like, you know, that's perfect. And 
And she was like, you know, whatever I can't do, my daughter, her 21 year old would do. And she had brought her daughter and met her. They were just this cute little like Gilmore girls team. Sure. Yeah. And, um, so again, I kind of thought like, are you sure you seem overqualified? And she said, you know what, why don't we do this? I have a, I have a business. It's called Elite Lux Life. Why don't you just hire like, you know, we, we can have you as a client. And rather than booking vacations for you and doing whatever, we will just assist you. And so then that way I can just, you know, bill you monthly. And once you're on your feet or you realize that, you know, you might not have needed that much help, we could just go our separate ways. And so I thought, oh, that seems like such a great deal. Uh, But that was her way of avoiding any background checks, which tells me, you know, this is someone who came in with intentions. This is someone who came in with criminal background that I didn't know about. And as much as we're not supposed to judge people, and I try not to, like at that time, I mean, she looked like a, I always say like a, like a Terry Hatcher. She was like quirky and cute and sweet and her and her daughter's relationship. And, you know, she played on the whole like horrible ex-husband and us women have to stick together. And yeah, she was just, she was a pro. Um, She sounds like she was so easy to talk to. She instantly, you know how you meet those people. They really just create that sense of comfort. It's a gift. And it sounds like she had that gift. She really did. Mm -hmm. And she would kind of feel things out. She would just sort of put feelers out there like, hey, I've got tickets to the Laker game today. And I'm like, oh, thank you, but I'm good. Okay, so she's not into that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Like she just would put feelers out. And, um, yeah. And I think that she kind of realized, noticed that my love language was my kids. So then she became extremely like always looking out for them, always trying to figure out how to help me with my kids. The way that she mostly got privy to my personal information, I believe it. I remember her saying, Hey, um, I know you're traveling. I'd love to have like your fridge stock for you when you get home. And I remember thinking to myself, that must be the concierge of her because that's not something I would ask of an assistant and I was like sure thank you that's kind but that was her having access to my home and my Mm -hmm. files I just think like again it was something she had in mind from the get-go and then she just like did little feelers and testers and overall the reason I think that it was to the level that it was is because she was she was forging power of attorneys she was opening bank Mm -hmm. accounts she was opening credit cards in my name she was receiving my mail she even, I mean, there were things were going straight to her home, you know, in my name, mm. it, you know, of course I found this out after like, uh, you know, really uh, deep forensics investigation yeah. and exploration, yeah, yeah. Was, but it really was, it was devastating to find out the level of criminal that this person, you know, was able to, and, you know, the sad part about, it, I always say she's not dumb. You know I mean? She speaks French, mm-hmm. she speaks Mandarin. She's, you know, very articulate, writes beautifully. You know, she would even like, you know, I remember having a guy come to the house to give me an estimate for Christmas lights. And I was like, oh, it's so much. And she's like, I got this. And it's $800 less now. So she basically was able to speak very intelligently, even in that example that you just provided where she decreased the, the Christmas lights from being a certain amount to- Without pre- even, without asking her to, you know what I mean? Like she just yes. always like went over and beyond and always acted so- enamored by, you know, my faith and, you know, the level of involvement I had with my church and, mm-hmm. you know, she would open up about that and just really like, you know, she just, she was, she was really good at what, at what she did. And it was, she was on full time. Like, it's not like I can say that one time I noticed she was like, you know, cussing someone out on the phone and throwing all kinds of F, like it wasn't. Right. She it was, was in like character a, all the time. time. Yeah. yeah. And I always, I got to go back because I think that this is such a common experience that can affect any of us where you mentioned that she really seemed to play on your emotions. I mean, she was very tactful and artful in how she observed what was important to you. So your relationship with your kids and would you say that she spent a good amount of time really playing into that? Yes. I think that she, she spent a lot of time playing into, you know, what was important to me and what wasn't. And, and again, I didn't notice it of course at at first, but I think that that's, um, you know, hindsight, of course, is 2020 looking back. Cause I look at how when she first started, it was more, she was trying to 
enamor me with things and access to the stuff that she had with the concierge and so opposite of who I am, you know, Mm -hmm. like that's nothing that I'm interested in. So once she kind of saw, okay, that's not her thing. Then she saw that, you know, my main focus, my main concern was always my children. So then it became helping me with that. And again, whether it was, I'm stressed out and sad about one of my kids. And so it's kind of like, let's get through this. And, you know, you know, this helped with my kid, you know, just really in touch with what was going on with me and wanting to be an emotional support. And by the grace of God, I never felt a great connection with her. I really felt like I didn't, I can't say that I ever, yeah, she wasn't someone that I would go to with an issue. She wasn't someone that I felt connected to in that type. Like I appreciated what she was bringing to the table. It was so kind and it was so wonderful to have that help. Cause of course, as a single mom full-time, it is nice to have any kind of help, even if it is with like bouncing a issue that your kids know back and forth, sure. whatever it is. So it was refreshing. And, but I can't say that it was someone who I felt a true connection. Was there something specific that if you go back and reflect, was it a gut instinct or just something that felt too much? I think there was maybe, well, I know that I'm as, as trusting as I am. I know that one of my biggest downfalls, I'm really trusting and I see the good in people. Hmm. I still believe it or not, you know, to get into my like really inner, inner circle, to be like very, very close with me. I have to really feel connected and usually on a spiritual level. Uh, and I think that there was a void there. Yeah. There was a, I appreciate like her trying. I appreciate her, you know, but maybe even at the time it was obvious that like you were just trying to fit into my world, which I appreciate, but it's, it's not something that you can pretend. It's something either you're consistent and you are and, and not saying that she wasn't that I thought she wasn't a good person. I just thought that there was no genuine connection. And I think you're speaking to, there is an authenticity that can't be acted. I mean, you're either an authentic person and I think acting abilities, it it only goes so far before there's a little something that prevents people from fully connecting. But to be very honest with you, I always thought it was an advantage because I thought, you know, I'm like my last personal assistant, I was just in Mexico with her last month because I helped her plan her wedding. Like I do get close to some people. Mm -hmm. So in my world, I also was thinking this is good because this is how a working relationship should be. I I shouldn't feel like this person is, you know, so I kind of thought that was progress on my part Mm -hmm. that look at me. I have someone in my life that I'm working with, but you know, I don't feel like they're a close friend. And that was a good thing. I thought, yeah. Oh yeah. That makes perfect sense. I also think that it was, it's a great example of of how a con artist can prey upon someone when they are experiencing a human vulnerability. I mean, thank you so much for sharing that about your diagnosis of stage one cancer. I mean, do you think that that played into just you being in a vulnerable state, looking for help, looking for something? A hundred percent. And I think that, and I did, I I genuinely did need the help and I'm not someone who usually asks for help. Yeah. And and I think that that was just also the pattern of the Mm -hmm. relationship after that was like, anytime she saw that, like, like whether I was stressed out because my, you know, ex-husband was being difficult about the children or like, I felt like she just kind of just here I am like, what can you know? And it was, it was fine. It was nice. Like I said, it's great to have someone to bounce things off of, but I didn't go to her with things, which, mm-hmm. which, and again, this is all the self-reflection of going like, wow, I never really felt that close to her. Cause she'd invite me to a lot of things. I never had the interest of going. Um, I remember when she was getting married and she invited me to her bachelorette, her weekend or whatever. Yeah. I remember thinking like, okay, you should go just go. Even if you go for a day, it would be nice. If, you know what I mean? And it was kind yeah. of like, I went for a day, part of it, you know, little I know I was paying for all of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but even like, I remember, you know, you know, I just remember how you felt, you don't remember, yeah. but I just remember feeling like, okay, this would be nice of you to do. Like you should do this. Like, it didn't you know, feel she, natural she though. Hmm? it didn't feel natural. Well, it didn't feel natural. It was just mm-hmm. more of like a thing to do, you know, rather than like, oh, I wouldn't, you know, I have friends that like, I would fly to Timbuktu and cancel the most important appointment and 
my life to not miss uh, important things in there. You know, it wasn't that type of thing. It was more of, you need to get out more. This will be fun. And you can't say no to everything. Right. And yeah. Well, and then I almost wonder too, because she had been so expert in consistently stepping up, swooping in, saving the day. I mean, is there any part of you that ever felt indebted? Like, oh, okay, she's done all this for me. It would be the right thing to do to support her. Right. You know what? There's probably some truth there, especially because, you know, what I was paying her, like what she was billing me for monthly, Hmm. you know, really was so beyond fair. Like she was, I, I thought for, cause I'm usually the person that's like getting taken advantage of. I'm usually the person that's overpaying, you know? So it was okay. so nice to be like, wow, you know, like this she's been an a lot. You know, and yeah. And um, like, I thought I was winning in this relationship. Okay. I can even think of you no know, times where, you know, she lived in this gorgeous building again, I was paying rent for it, <laughs> but my kids, whenever they were in that area and they had like time to kill between school or whatever, they would go over there to like use the facilities use. And I would always say like, be mindful, like don't, don't stay too long. Like I was really on top of my kids about that when really here we are. And I actually saw that I made the first down payment of her moving in there. And the funny thing, is she covered her bases as far as like, why would you be living there? You know, like, even if you have a concierge service, even if you are picking up these side gigs, this building's insane. Like, why would you be? And before you even ask her these questions, she always had an alibi. Like, I remember her just coming over and saying like, we're moving to the 10,000 and we're so fortunate. I met the person, the executive assistant to whoever, and they we worked a deal where we do their concierge. And, you know, we're in the smallest apartment, but, you know, so we're there for like really minimal rent and, but we do all their concierge and, you know, like she always, before you even question it, she's already got an answer. So you never even question anything. She was good. Oh, she's a all problem. her bases were covered. Mm-hmm. So Jumana, how did things, I guess, increase? And I'm hearing you say I paid, I, I ended up finding out after the fact I funded her lifestyle, essentially. Yeah. What do you mean when, when you say that? So when I first, when I first found out about um, a credit card, I honestly didn't know what it was. I was like, Oh, this is so weird. My financial guy, you know, pointed it out. And that's when she, she on her own, once she saw that I was, you know, worried about that, she didn't waste any time. She came over like 20 minutes later and was just, you know, crying and upset and just basically, you know, fell to her knees, like literally. And I'm so sorry. You know, one time I was opening your mail and I saw this pre-approved credit card and I was in a bind and I was like, you know, I'll just pay it right back. You know, she won't even realize it. And I'm a horrible person and you should call the cops and I don't deserve to live. And like, it was so dramatic. And again, you know, knowing my character, working my emotions and knowing the kind of person I am, So I, you know, it was a combination of two things. It was a combination of me thinking like, you know, she made a mistake. Obviously this person does not need to be near my finances, Mm -hmm. but a horrible person. And these reasons that she gave me, you know, with her husband and all these things, the reason she needed this, this quick money were (laughs) heart-wrenching. But I also thought to myself that anytime someone gets money stolen from them, you could report the person, but you don't get your money back. So I kind of thought, you know, well, why don't I work a deal? Listen, I won't call, I'm not going to call the cops. You don't deserve to like, you know, I don't want to put you in the hands of the law because you're not a horrible person and that's going to ruin everything that you've built with your business. And little did I know, you know, this woman had a record. So we worked out a deal where she was going to kind of work it off and then also give me money periodically. Like she's okay. like, you know, you don't understand. Sometimes I, when I rent the, when I rent out the house in, you know, for Coachella, that's like an easy 10 grand for you. And that's, you know, and then it was going to be paid off. And she actually showed that. So like th- we did this for a couple months and she would come over with like 5,000. And then next day she would come over with like 3,000. And so I was just tallying and I'm like, wow, you know, she really is doing this. Uh, one time I needed to rent a car and she was like, take our G wagon you know, and, you know, usually they rent that out for like, I don't know, $2,000 a week or something. Mm-hmm. So every week I, I was like crediting her to that, you know, so it was kind of ah. like that type of deal, but it just never sat right with me, you know, it never felt right. And I, and again, I'm really, I'm really big on my word. And so I did tell her like, listen, no one needs to know about this. 
So I, I honestly never told a soul. Like I never told wow. my best friend. I didn't tell my financial guy. I didn't tell anyone. It was really between the two of us. And she would even like, you know, randomly send me a text or an email, just like, I am just woke up in the middle of the night. I'm so grateful for you. Like, I can't believe that, you know, like where I'm like, it's over. Like you made a mistake. You learned from it. Yeah. We're going to move on. You're going to work this off. Mm-hmm. I've changed mm-hmm. all my passwords. Good I've for you. My locks on my house. Like everything is different. So yeah. um, I'm being careful, the boundaries, you know, of what you have access to. So I, again, it made sense. Definitely should have just called my financial advisor that day. <laughs> and yeah, at the time it seemed like I was doing yeah. the right thing, mm-hmm. but it didn't sit right with me. And one day, you know what? I woke up and decided I'm going to call my financial guy and just let him know. First of all, I didn't like the lie that I told him that I had to sit with because he's someone who's just had my back for a really long time and he's great. But the, th- the reason I never told him is because I knew he's like a no nonsense guy. Like mm-hmm. he would have made sure I went to the cops, you know? Mm-hmm. which would have been the right thing to do. Uh, so anyways, uh, I decided to just call him and tell him, you know, Hey, remember that card? It really was Tracy. And of course, you know, he was so upset with me. And so once we got past that, he was like, okay, well, you need to go and you need to cancel all your credit cards. We need to cancel this, cancel that. You need to like fire her as of immediately, whatever. Mm-hmm. So I sent her a text and I said, Hey, just so you know, I told Ron, you know, you can't work for me anymore. And then she text me back and said, so I'm assuming you don't want to talk to me. And then I didn't respond. And so then I started calling, you know, Bank of America. That was my first call to just cancel my card this time, not change okay. password. And I was lucky enough that there was someone on the other line who was on the other end of the line saying, you know, okay, well, what about your other card? And I'm like, I only have one card. And I only oh, have one, you know, I just check got me chills. Mm. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it was interesting because he explained to me, he said, you know, the way that that this woman did it was, I don't know how she got access, but she became the main holder of the accounts and only gave you partial access. So I was only able to see what I knew I already had, Hmm. where she had opened all this other stuff that she could see the big picture. I only saw that later. I found out that she had signed a power of attorney and had it notarized and all that. Like we, we, we got to the bottom of all of it, but that was like the, oh my gosh, you know, then that's when I called Ron back and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much more. So then they dove in on their end. I dove in on my end and yeah, my home looked like Quantico. Like it was crazy. I had stuff taped all over the place. We had, and we found every nook and cranny and it was insane. Thank God that I just didn't feel comfortable about it. So it wasn't like I found out more stuff and then fired her. I actually just it didn't sit right with me, the deal that I made with her. And mm. so how was she able to become your power of attorney? Did she forge documents? Yeah. So she forged the documents and she even had them notarized where we, we have a notary that comes to the house and he looked through his books and he was like, no, you did a notary that day, but it was for something else. And so she'd stuck one piece of paper in my pile and the paper that she stuck in the pile really had nothing on it, but a signature line. And then the rest of the power of attorney was initialing. So she did all the initialing mm. and they kind of can see now in the paperwork that, oh, the initials are clearly not yours, but the signature was, okay. but you were signing for this certain document that day. Sure. Oh my gosh. So it's very, I mean, it seems to me as if she very much was calculated in her approach that she oh, knew. I and think so- calculated and like gets off on it. Like, I think it's mm-hmm. like an addiction. I think that there is a, cause when you look at everything she did, there really was no end game, you mm-hmm. know, like, mm-hmm. because the next step I did after I found out about the credit cards, I just said, Yo, let me just go check my credit. Cause that'll just yes. give me a list of everything out there. And I'm like, I pride myself having perfect credit. Like that's just yeah. so important to me. My credit was 400. Oh, gee, and that's where I saw the different credit cards, the different, you know, all, everything was right there. So it was easy for me to go through stuff. And it wasn't easy to get that stuff like taken away. Cause she, she had opened and, you know, ran up like a million five hundred dollars worth of credit card debt. And so now I have to prove to these people that it's fraud, but they're saying, no, it was paid from your bank account. Mm. Okay. But you don't understand. I didn't open that, but you know, so it was a big process. It was very frustrating, very hard, but I finally got that done. It took a a really long time. And then they finally arrested her 
And she got out on bail like a day later. Where is this woman now? Whatever happened to Tracy now? She's just, you know, like I said, white collar crime takes a really long time. I mean, this started in 2018 okay. and we're in 2022. And so it's frustrating because you know she's doing this to a million people on different levels. She's opened two restaurants. She's able to, you know, travel around the United States. She's like from the looks of her social media, she's okay. just living her best life until her, uh, I think her court date is September 22nd now, but that keeps getting moved. So hoping that really is a trial date. Yeah, that's unbelievable. I did read an article that said that she, one of her restaurants was essentially like a ripoff of another oh, restaurant. It was. And yeah, she totally ripped off everything. Mm-hmm. Like she, you know, robbed his identity as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm hoping that he'll have some justice in this too, that when she gets put away, you know, somehow, you know, her, that brand can, you know, go back to him. Absolutely. Well, I definitely think it indicates that something is definitely amiss in terms of, of course, I can only speculate. I can't formally diagnose in this setting, but something mm-hmm. is obviously amiss that she would continue with the cons and the scams um, to no to no end. I mean, it's just been mm-hmm. ongoing since yeah. what happened with you. Yeah. And, and then now she's just been pushing her trial and pushing her trial. And honestly, like the whole like white, you know, white crime White collar, white collar crime, crime. Mm-hmm. And white <laughs> but honestly, and I, that was so politically incorrect, but it's true. I think because she's a uh, white female, mm-hmm. she's really getting such a, you know, a privileged treatment. Yeah. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's sad, but it's, you know, it is what it is in, in a world. The yeah, frustrating part there is that she's like the picture of cultural appropriation. You know, she always has her hair in box braids and she went and got all this plastic surgery and implants and, you know, Brazilian butt and has two restaurants now and claims that they're black owned because her husband is black. And, and I just think that's so funny. I'm like, oh, see, you know, it's pretty, you know, problematic because you're, you know, using your white privilege when it comes to this, but meanwhile, you're getting money and capitalizing on minorities. The con continues. Uh, on just multiple layers. Yeah. You said that it was almost like she got off on it. And I mean, that Mm -hmm. is such a trait of psychopathic and sociopathic individual is they, even the level of dopamine that flows through their brain, we all have it. It takes them four times the amount to be the equivalent of you or I, you know, like uh-huh. a normal brain. And so they, they constantly, write that down. <laughs> it's I constant. thought I did all my research on sociopaths and, but that's a good one. That's, that actually puts things in perspective. Yeah. It was a, a body of research. I think it came out in 2012 and it just showed that that's why they're always reward seeking. It's like the hamster in the wheel. It's never ending. They're trying to pump that dopamine and get it released. I'm and telling then, you, when you look at all of this, you're like, what is, it's almost scary. It's like the end game was either kill me or like what, because how do you end right. this? Like, you know, I mean, she drained my kids' college funds. Granted, wow. I wasn't using them. So I wasn't looking at them, mm. but I was like months away from starting to use them. So what would have happened when I go in there and I'm like, what, where's all these transactions? Mm-hmm. Like that's just curious to know. And I mean, yeah. maybe she's also delusional where she was like, I was going to come across all this money and pay it all back. You know, mm-hmm. maybe there's some truth to that delusion, but no end game. I mean, it almost makes me wonder, was she trying to take your identity completely? It was, I mean, it looked like it when you, it, when you look yeah. at my credit report. Absolutely. And I don't know if you and so much my, I, she was living her life through my identity. Do you know what I mean? So I think that that was, she was, she was more definitely trying to take my life or how she would live my life if she were me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How has it been for you since all of this happened? What was, I don't know if there was a recovery process that had to happen or how have you been able to come out of this and just heal? The whole being hands-on and diving in and my six month turning the home into Quantico was yes. very therapeutic. You know, it really was. And having, con- and that also gave me control of all of my own finances, all of my own everything, you know, where I think there was a little fear there before where I didn't, you know, understand or, you know, yeah. 
you know, it was kind of like that, like learned helplessness. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of um, probably the best, most therapeutic. And then it was kind of nice because like, the kids came to other, it was very family bonding. You kind of, this is something like we as a whole were pretty much assaulted by this as a team. And so yes. we were, you know, trying to recover as a team. And you all rallied together, it sounds like, yeah. and yeah. fought this head on. Mm-hmm. I think that that is so vulnerable and just helpful for you to share, because I think that that is so common in, in any household, even whether it's a man being intimidated by the financial aspect. So their, you know, significant other handles everything, or the, the woman is overwhelmed by that or doesn't dive in head first. If you could add anything else or any recommendations for somebody watching, yeah. just to be aware of that things like this happen or what they can do to protect themselves. What are your, I mean, I'm not going to take away from the fact that she was such a pro and she Uh was, you know, you you can't control if people are signing documents and forging. And, you know, I mean, there's a certain level of con artists that can get the best of us Uh and the most educated and the most financially woke, you know, but I will say that if I'm being super transparent, there's, there are things I could have caught sooner if I was more involved in my finances and my own business. I think that, yeah, there is that learned helplessness where you kind of, because the people that are taking care of my money are amazing, but they're taking care of a million people's money. And they also, they're not living your life personally. So if something is signed by you and, you know, even they could be like, wow, that was a stupid purchase. You know, Tamana must be losing her mind, but they're not you. Yes. You know what I mean? And I'm not a numbers person. Like, you know, people are like, I did great in math, horrible in English, whatever. I'm a writer. I'm a speech and communications major. I yes. you know, definitely am not a math numbers person. And it, it's so not as intimidating and scary as I made it in my head. And I think that um, it was too bad that I had to go through that to really yeah. push myself to know every nook and cranny. But um, I would really encourage, you know, especially, and I'm sure men, like you said, are in the same boat too, where they could be intimidated, but especially women who are married to someone that, you know, you have financial people and you have everybody taken care of, you know, like with, with my marriage to Jason, there was no place for me in that. There really wasn't, you know what I mean? Like it was just teams of people. And so I think when we split up, I felt like I needed that help Yeah. yeah. around the clock rather than, you know, starting to, take more responsibility on my own. And I, and it, it's fear-based and not having the confidence in myself. But um, I think that I would encourage women to be more confident there because it's definitely not as scary as you think. And of course you need people. I have the greatest team and stuff, but like I said, you know, no one knows you as well as you. Right. And therefore when you do have someone as good of a con artist, you know, it wouldn't take as long to hopefully figure out or to, you know, start digging and reveal something like that. Absolutely. I love that. So really empowering yourself to take the bull by the horns, check Mm -hmm. out the bank accounts, check the numbers out, know what's coming and going. Mm -hmm. And I I also think it goes without saying, watch who you allow in your life. But even if you do allow people in, that seemingly are good people, they can often turn on you. Any thoughts on that aspect on the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, just the double life that people live. I just, you know, I'm such a believer that, you know, we view things by the condition of our own hearts Yes. and you don't want to change your heart. You don't want to, you know, Mm -hmm. become a bitter. I mean, I've been through stuff before Tracy that could have, mm-hmm. you know, hardened my heart or made me lose trust. And I just, I choose not to, yeah. I choose to, you know, definitely be more specific and more protective without being cynical. Mm-hmm. But I do think that you have got to go with your gut feeling, your instincts, and you've got to also just know that nothing should surprise you. Like, you, you know, as, as pure as your heart is, even though you don't think you don't have a criminal mind or you don't have that type of mind. People are, are really capable of doing some stuff that you can't wrap your brain around. And just yes. because you can't, you know, doesn't mean that they, they wouldn't. And so if you don't know someone that well, and you're kind of like, Hmm, mm-hmm. don't blame yourself. Like, why are you being so judgy? You know what I mean? Where I tend to do that more. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying don't give people the benefit of the doubt, but 
it's okay to question things. Yeah, absolutely. There, there is such a, I guess, misconception when it comes to judging the world around us, that that's a negative thing. And of course we know that that can be very negative, but Mm -hmm. also part of, you know, even the Myers Briggs personality test, there's the judger side of it. And Mm -hmm. so if you're a judger, you're just being more careful on gathering the facts, learning the information, And I think that's where women and men can get in trouble by trying to take that stance of everyone is good. Maybe just ignoring some signs that can go on. I love what you said. Trust your gut. That's my roundabout way to affirm what you said. Trust your gut. And, you know, and have that confidence in yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jamana, any other final thoughts that you wish to share with anybody watching? Um, No, I mean, you know, just basically, I'm glad you're giving me this opportunity because I think that um, it would be selfish for me not to share my story. And it's easy to be embarrassed when Mm -hmm. something like this happens to you, but I'm choosing not to look at it that way. I'm choosing to, you know, look at it as the human that I am and things do happen. And I would rather, you know, share my story story. And, you know, even if someone listens to this and has a quick epiphany and is like, wait, maybe I should, you know, yeah. then, then I'm happy. Well, thank you. I cannot thank you enough for coming on. And that is also something I just want to get out there too, that something of this nature can happen to any one of us. That's what I talk a lot about in folks that end up joining cultic groups or get involved in a domestic violence relationship any of us can be susceptible. If we're going through our own hard time in life, a big transition, then it makes us all the more easier to fall prey to someone who seemingly swoops in and can seem like they're saving the day. And especially somebody who's narcissistic all over the map, it it, it can really happen to any one of us. So thank you so, so much. I appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Big thanks to Jumana for coming on the channel today and sharing her story. A couple really important things that I learned from speaking with her and also things that were just reinforced to me after really diving into what con artists have in common and scam artists and individuals who engage in manipulation is that as you can see, there was really this pattern of befriending Jumana, really catering to what her needs were. I thought that it was also particularly interesting how from what Jumana described, this woman was able to find what worked for Jumana. This is no different than what we see with high control and even cultic groups in that they often have a hook. They have something that really draws you in and causes a level of trust to be created in some capacity. So this is an experience that can happen to just about any one of us. A couple quick helpful hints and pieces of information I just want to throw out there is that when you meet someone, if they seem too good to be true, then they may just be. (laughs) So always pay attention to your gut instinct, what your radar is telling you, and then also trust but verify. So of course, in this day and age, when you're in a time of need or you're going through high levels of transition and looking for help or looking for support, it can be really easy to fall prey to someone who seems to be offering what it is you're looking for. But it is so vitally important, as even Jumana shared, to go back and do the background check if you're hiring them or take your time in this process. Get to know a person, get to know a group, make sure that they have your best interests at heart. Sometimes it does take time for someone's true character to fully play out. But as Maya Angelou said, when people show you who they are, believe them. So at the first sign that there may be a crack in a facade or you sense that there's something dishonest going on or you are experiencing something physiologically or emotionally that is causing you to question what is really happening, so important to pay attention to this. 
We all know that con artists are extremely adept and skilled at emotional manipulation in addition to other forms of manipulation, but there are also a couple other characteristics to keep in mind that include a con artist has an excellent way and skill set in being able to spin a story. So if the person in question always seems to have the perfect response, the perfect answer, it pulls at your heartstrings every time, this may be a potential indicator. In addition to this, con artists will almost always dress the part of whatever con they are attempting to engage in. There's a constant effort put forth to present in a certain way, oftentimes to posture as extremely professional or successful. This posturing or dressing the part is all done in an effort to win over someone else's confidence in them. So if they dress the part, they talk the part, they look the part, you're going to be much more likely to give them a little bit of your trust or a lot a bit of your trust. Again, I hope you enjoyed this interview. I am so, so grateful to Jumana for coming on and sharing her story. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure that you catch my other playlist on psychological commentary and any of my previous live streams. I did just do one on the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. So make sure you check it out. All of this is linked in the playlist over here, but also down in the description below. So as always, be wow.